On today's episode of the EV Show, we talk about our dual, do-it-all, dual dueling motors and our double cab. I can't say that twice. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us today. For those of you that have been following EV West for quite some time, I'm sure you've seen the green shop truck. It's been on you know, all of our socials and our feeds, but we've never really done a video with it. Uh, everybody else has seemed to have shot with it. We've shot Jay Leno with it. We've shot you know, the Today Show. It's been on Top Gear. Everyone's driven this from the Stig to you know, people from the Porsche family to Ludacris. I mean, you name it, they've been in it and they've driven it. And uh, so we just wanted to, to drive it for ourselves and put a little video on our EV West channel. We get a lot of questions about this. This was uh, really a working platform for us uh, in the early days. We, we brought this in back in 2015. And uh, what we were really trying to do, as you, as you know, is we're really looking to get more power in the cars. And so uh, from day one, when we built our Pikes Peak car back in 2011, uh, we did an early dual motor setup in that, and, and the impetus for that project was actually uh, a, a dual motor 911 that was built, in, built by a, a gentleman named Sebastian Bourgeois over at a company called Evnetics. Uh, Evnetics is no longer with us, but they're famous for making the Soliton 1 controller that you guys know of, the old brush DC controller. So we wanted to take something with that power of the 911, but put it in a more modern, capable car and go hill climb racing with it. So we did a dual uh, net gain motors, warp 11 system in our E36 BMW and had tons of power. On the dyno, we were close to 900 foot pounds at the rear wheels. It's a fantastic car, uh, but just a beast. I mean, an absolute beast to drive. You couldn't really daily it. You couldn't take it to lunch or anything like that. So we wanted to build, we wanted to take that uh, build methodology and just kind of apply it to a more street drivable vehicle, right? And that's what we have here in the double cab. So we started with the AC50, the brushless motor from HP EVS. And uh, at this point, no one's really done a dual system with it. So we used the green truck to actually develop that system, develop the engineering, uh, the belt drive connectivity and all that. And uh, for the dual motor system now that we sell, this, this was actually the development platform. So it's kind of neat. We finished the system. Um, and then went into production and then actually replaced the system with the production piece because its initial dual motor system uh, was just, uh, it was just prototype, you know. So, uh, so we're going to take it for a drive today. We're going to talk about some of the details. We're going to show it, uh, show the battery pack, the motor, and just kind of everything and just kind of go over what has been really special to EV West and is what has really helped develop the, the dual and the triple. I mean, the, the base engineering of this we used when we did the triple motor Ferrari, the world's first electric Ferrari. And I mean, there's so much DNA in here and so much dual motor stuff that the EV industry's now picked up. We just deserved, uh, we thought she deserved a chance to get a little bit of credit for it and get out in the sunshine. Uh, she still gets driven a ton. She's got over 40,000 miles on it now, but uh, give, her, give her some action. So uh, let's go through the truck. Let's check it out. All right, so one of the most common questions we get asked about is the battery because it's normally not visible. You just never see it. We go to car shows and people look under the car and in the car and they never see the battery pack. I think they expect it in the bed, um, but it's actually under the rear seat. Uh, quick side note, when we're looking at some of the footage of the pack, there's tons of horsehair everywhere. The horsehair falls out of the 
factory seat and falls onto the battery. So uh, we just wanted to leave it uh, as natural as we could for you. Appreciate it. <laughs> and the double cab has this nice little storage area here uh, that goes back about another 20, 30 inches uh, and gives us enough room for our, our battery module. Now our battery is using the Tesla smart module that we sell. It's a three kilowatt hour battery and we have 18 of them in here for 54 kilowatt hour of total energy. The batteries are arranged in 9P 2S. So basically overall it's a 30S system, 120 volt. Um, and the 9P is parallel, so that gives us plenty of energy. Uh, gives us that 54 kilowatt hour, which gives the truck about 180 miles of range, which is really nice, really functional. Um, the other fantastic thing about the battery, the placement is central to the axles and it's really low. Uh, so it gives the truck a really good handling characteristic. I mean, you can, um, you can really go into a turn pretty quick. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of body roll. The weight keeps it planted. Uh, and just makes it feel a little bit more secure um, when you're driving it. So it's, it's in, in a weird way, the weight adds a little bit of a benefit. It softens the ride a little bit, uh, you know, helps control body roll and just gives an overall, you know, kind of better, better road handling. Um, so that's the battery. I don't know if there's too much more to say. We actually manually do a BMS on this one. When we built the system in 2015, uh, we did not have a reliable BMS. We were having, um, a lot of issues with the BMSs that were on the market at the time. And so we manually balanced this and it turned out to be a great decision because uh, six years later, uh, we checked the balance on it the other day and we were six millivolts delta voltage. So really, really tight pack, uh, no BMS. We manually monitor it. We check balance, you know, oh, every couple, we'd like to think every couple months, but you know, maybe once a quarter, uh, once every half year or something like that. Uh, but that's the pack. Uh, we'll move on to the rest of the car, show some more details. And here's just a quick shot with the seat back in. Plenty of room back here. It doesn't intrude on the passenger compartment. And there's still a little bit of space underneath here if we need any tools or a, you know, a jack or a tow kit or something like that. So uh, keeping it functional and keep the battery out of the uh, cabin. So a couple other small details we want to mention. We are not cooling our battery. It's, uh, it is plumbed for liquid cooling. Uh, but monitoring the battery temperatures, we have such a big pack, again, nine modules in parallel, that we, we can't really warm up the batteries with the system that we have in this truck. It's not a Tesla system or something that can pull thousands of amps. So uh, we have cooling plums, but we're actually not using it, so it's not needed. Uh, the other thing is we, the enclosure, we use the steel of the cab itself as our enclosure, and then we mounted, we, we installed some aluminum rails and they're drilled and tapped and we mounted those to the chassis and then mounted the batteries to those. So the batteries are mounted to the chassis through an aluminum, a billet aluminum rail mounting system. And so that's why you don't see the enclosure around it. Uh, we just use the enclosure of the seat. Um, and I think that's about most of the details for the battery. All right, so, you know, not a lot of upgrades needed, but one thing that is important, we did upgrade the brakes. Now, this has four-wheel disc brakes, and after installing the four-wheel disc brake kit, we realized you don't really need disc brakes on the rear axle because we have regenerative braking. So, uh, with our customers now, we do recommend a disc brake upgrade for the front axle, not as important on the rear axle, especially if you get into really fine tuning the programming on your regenerative braking. You know, the truck does have a single motor, a single AC50 gives you about three times the stock power of a Volkswagen bus. So by having a dual motor system in there, we have roughly six times the power, right? So we're at about uh, 240 foot pounds of torque, uh, around 220 electric horsepower running through here. And that's a lot, so it can get up and go pretty quick. We've never done a top speed test or a zero to 60, but you can rest assured that it's good advice when we tell you, you definitely want a good set of brakes up front. Don't worry about disc brakes in the rear. You're gonna program yourself a real strong regen rate. You can save a little bit of money there. All right, not a lot to see on this side, but we do have our charge port over here in the old fuel filler location. And so we just opened it up here and we actually repurposed our original gas cap. So we have that on our J1772 inlet and we can charge here at 110 volt and we can charge also at 220 volt. Something that we did um, in this truck and we um, recommend it to some of our other customers as well is we did a dual charger system. And what that allows you is on your daily charging, you just use one of the chargers and you have a lower charge rate that's a little bit better for the battery's longevity. 
but we have a second charger in there that can be activated with a simple dash switch and that gives you twice the charging power. You can charge the battery much quicker so when you're out you know, traveling around or using a charging station or like in our case we go on camping trips in it, uh, we use both chargers and we can cut our charge time in half. So that's a really neat feature. We kind of recommend dual chargers if you're looking for something like this with a bit of flexibility. All right, folks, this is as real as it gets. And you can tell it's real because I didn't even clean this. <laughs> it is so dirty. Uh, this thing gets driven all the time. Um, you know, I take my kid to school in the morning with it. Uh, we run shop errands in it and we, we really, really drive it. Uh, 40,000 miles, six years. Um, and it's just been flawless back here. The, these are the original motors, original controllers. Um, everything has just been fine. We had a DC converter fail on us uh, about two weeks into the job. Um, and then we replaced it. It was a, a lesser brand that we don't uh, sell anymore, which is nice. And we replaced it with another one that we do sell. And this one's been going for about five and a half years now without any issues. But uh, so other than that, pretty trouble free. You know, we get asked a lot, you know, what's the long-term maintenance? Um, and this is a Volkswagen. So my long-term maintenance is all the Volkswagen parts and none of the EV parts. We've got leaky axle seals, um, squeaks and rattles. The front brakes always need to be adjusted. There's more play in the steering wheel than you can imagine. Uh, I mean, just a whole host of regular, typical Volkswagen stuff, you know. Um, but when it comes to the EV drive, the vehicle's really solid and we, we've, you know, we raced this. We've had it at Laguna Seca for the refuel event. Um, we were constantly doing donuts and playing around. We've done track times at Top Gear and um, so it's just, it's just a, a truck that's really been abused. We haven't been nice to it. And um, oddly, she's been really nice to us. So treating us real well. So just a quick overview. I'm just gonna go over the components and where we laid everything out. Here we have our maintenance switch. We use this not for emergencies, but just turn off the high voltage if we're gonna be working on the vehicle. Inside here, we have some high voltage fuses for the charger and the DC converter. And we also have our main fuse for the battery pack in there. We've got our twin inverters. This one is the master inverter, so all of the analog controls go into this one. The throttle signals, the brake signals, everything goes into this controller over here, and then it communicates with the secondary controller via CAN bus. So it's a, it's a secondary controller, a satellite controller that just runs off CAN bus commands from the initial controller. And what that does is it keeps the motors in sync. They're connected with a uh, Goodyear, um, Goodyear Eagle NRG synchronous drive belt, but uh, we want to keep their load the same. We want to keep um, you know, the, the current draw. We want to keep their temperatures the same. And so that's all regulated through the HPVS dual motor system. Their firmware actually regulates that and keeps everything real equal. And uh, you know, the dual motors here with the adapter, uh, we're at about 110 pounds for each motor and about 10 pounds in adapter. So this entire setup here is about, uh, it's about 230 pounds. Um, which is really lightweight. That's right in uh, line with a, a factory Volkswagen motor. It's about 250 pounds. And uh, over here on the right, we've got a cooling system. We've got a couple fans and uh, a small radiator below. And then we're running a small reservoir up there with a D5 coolant pump, uh, just your standard uh, D5 coolant pump. So again, a real, real affordable. There's nothing real exotic in here. There's nothing uh, real expensive. Um, we've mated these to the factory transaxle, but we did do our modification to turn it into a two-speed. So we have a factory 512 uh, rear end, our differential is, uh, I'm sorry, 412. We have a 412 rear end in it. And then we're running a um, uh, 189 first gear and an 082 second gear. Uh, so it's about two to one between the two gears. And with the AC50 motor and the Hyper 9s, we, we try to target about 10 miles an hour for every 1,000 RPM in first gear and 20 miles an hour for every 1,000 RPM in second gear. And that gives a pretty good ratio, real, real wide range. You can use it for the city. And then, of course, on the freeway, use second gear. Um, I think that's about the most common questions that we get on the drive end of this. And, um, you know, if you have any other questions, just, you know, put them in the comments below. All right, we just want to take you to the cab real quick and go over what we have up here. So over here, we added this plate in. 
And this just gives us some real basic controls. Of course, we've got the stereo over here, but we have a reverse switch. So electronically, we engage reverse with this switch here. Makes it really easy. We have a heater, which is really nice, and it's forced air. So it works much nicer than a typical Volkswagen heater. We've got our dual charger, so I can turn on my secondary charger with this one and increase the charge rate. And I've got variable regen, so I have two settings and I can go between high and low regen rate. Um, so the, the Curtis AC50 system does come with some instrumentation. We don't use it very much because all of the parameters are set in the vehicle and the vehicle can run you know, uh, perfectly fine. You can run it to its limit and it will, it will regulate itself. So we don't need to follow the instrumentation, but behind the radio plate here, we put in the factory instrumentation so we can go through and we can actually get air codes if there's any. We can get our current, our voltage, our RPM, our temperature of the motor, temperature of the controller. So there's a lot of information that comes over this instrumentation, but for the most part, EVs are so trouble free. We just keep the, the radio plate on it and actually don't really monitor it, to be totally honest. It's a great feeling because um, if you have a regular Volkswagen, you're literally monitoring everything. You're like, what's that noise? Did something fall off? Uh, with the EV, it just cruises. Yep. Uh, over here, we have our TBS Expert Pro. This is a state of charge meter. It just tells us what kind of charge we have. Right now, we've got about 64.9%, and we can go in and look at our voltage, 113 volts, and uh, we can look at our amp hours and some other stuff. But for the most part, it's just your gas gauge. I know I've got about 65% in the truck, and I can keep on cruising. The best things about the electric EVs is driving them with a manual transmission. As we mentioned before, we do have a two-speed transmission in here. It makes it quite easy. But we do get questions about the use of the, uh, the clutch and do I need to slip it? How often do I shift? So basically, you turn the car on and the electric motor is not going to stall. It can't because it's electric. So you simply just put it in gear, give it a little bit of throttle input. And just like that, uh, we're off and you can start and stop the vehicle just like a golf cart. You don't need to use the clutch and we can drive around in first. We can shift at any time to second. We've got enough torque in the vehicle that it can go from a dead stop and second gear all the way up to 100 and some odd mile an hour without any effort. So it's kind of nice. It makes it really convenient and easy to drive. Um, just kind of get in it here a little bit. Clutch, shift nice and smooth and now we're in high gear instead of low gear and uh, we still have plenty of pickup in low. So it's really nice that the EV system, you know, one of the things that it does is it just really improves the drivability. It makes the vehicle so much easier to drive that you enjoy driving it more and therefore you actually drive the vehicle more. So you get out, you put more miles on it and get it around. And, uh, you know, we do these drive alongs and we try and explain everything that we're doing, but you know, I gotta be honest, it's just kind of like driving a really, really cool golf cart with split windows that everybody loves so much. We did add an electric assist on the steering and this is a popular option. Uh, this one's by Light Steer. We don't sell it in particular. We sell one by uh, ePower Steering. They didn't have an application for the Volkswagen. But it is nice. You're putting a little bit of extra weight in the vehicle and you're kind of modernizing it. So it is nice to be able to put in electric power steering. So we recommend that as an option. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick test of the traction control system. That's right, we don't have traction control. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that I have a, a dual rate for the region, which is kind of nice. And uh, so when we're going down a hill, I want a little extra stopping power. Instead of getting into the brakes, I can just pull this button here. And uh, without using the brakes or anything, the truck will come to a nice uh, slow stop and that puts energy back in our battery pack and it doesn't wear down my disc brake pads or heat up the rotors. So what so you get with the electric drive system, which is really nice, is you get a very accurate throttle control. So I can hold the vehicle with just a little bit of input, I can ease it forward, and I can actually roll off and let it roll backwards. So you have this finite control in systems that, like our race car has a thousand horsepower 
yet we have the you know we can drive it with the precision and the control of uh, pardon me but of a prius right uh and so that makes it nice we had you know we got into this from racing high horsepower combustion cars and pulling those on the trailer was always really really like nerve-wracking because uh, you know, if the clutch grabbed or anything like that, you could have a pretty bad accident. And, you know, pulling the, the electric race car onto the trailer, into the box trailer is so uh, mellow, it, you know, that the contrast isn't lost on us. So it's neat to have a vehicle that is so well behaved at low speed, but at the same time has so much speed, so much power and so much torque when you need it. You know, we do get asked how we handle reverse with our two-speed transmission not having reverse. So we've done it electronically. And I'm gonna go ahead and engage it right now. And it doesn't do anything. If I give it a little bit of throttle input, the truck slows down and then actually goes backwards. So it makes it really nice and easy to control the direction of drive. And you can do it at any time. You can be going down the freeway at 60 miles an hour and change the drive direction and you won't have any issues. So there's no grinding of gears or anything like that. And if for any random reason, I lose the brake system, if the hydraulic brake system fails on me, I can actually use reverse as a brake by giving, by moderating the throttle input. So I'll do that right now by accelerating. And I'm gonna coast and I'm gonna use the throttle to come to a nice safe stop. And that's using all regenerative braking right there. So it's kind of neat to have a backup system, especially on a bus that was built 50 years ago. It's comforting. Well, so I got to admit, there's actually another reason we did the video in the double cab. And it's because uh, we are going to start uh, doing another system in here with the Tesla drive. And uh, we've been working on our bolt-in Volkswagen subframe for quite some time. We've got it perfected now. Um, we've installed them in several different applications and we finally decided it's time to upgrade the shop truck. So over the next couple months, you'll be seeing some videos coming out on our bolt-in subframe uh, for the Tesla going in our shop truck and we can follow that build as well. Uh, can never rest, and that's for sure, not in technology. All right, thanks for hanging out with us today. We appreciate your time. Uh, our little uh, double cab. You know, quick little story before we go. The, uh, the double cab, you don't see many of these because of something called the chicken tax. And uh, what this was is in 1964, President Johnson actually imposed a tax on France and Germany uh, because they imposed a tax on us importing chickens. So our retaliation for their chicken tax was a tax on light commercial duty pickup trucks. And of course, this is a light commercial duty pickup truck. So this is a 1965. So this came into the United States under the chicken tax. It had a 25% tariff on it. And because of that, it made the, the vehicle a little bit more expensive and they didn't sell a ton of them. It wasn't the runaway success that it definitely could have been. And uh, so you don't see a lot of them and we kind of refer to it as the chicken tax truck. And you hear that phrase a lot and just wanted to tell a quick little story. And to this day, the chicken, sta the chicken tax still exists and that's why you've got companies like Toyota who set up shop over here to make their pickups in the U.S. And that's why you have companies like Ford who are importing the Transit Connect commercial vehicle as a passenger van with seats and windows. And then they take all that stuff out, cover the windows and sell it as a commercial truck. So uh, still really weird that, you know, decades and decades after, war, after the war that created this tax, we still have it and we're still dealing with it. And to this day, the double cabs are still very rare because of it. And... Uh, Thought we'd just highlight that. Anyways, thanks again for joining us on this episode of the EV Show. We appreciate the views. We appreciate the comments. Thanks for liking the video, sharing it with your friends, and uh, just enjoying the EV community.